This is a drawing for that print I did toys in the basement or the cellar. Uh, the surface is smooth. There's a horse and rider up there that shows that there is stillness up there. And down underneath is where all the trouble starts. With that strange figure with a pillow head and those hands playing cat's cradle. And this just came out of me. And it's on rockers. You see the rockers? Yes. Yeah. And this strange drum shape with the stripes. I don't know. And there's a stacked artwork or something. Stacked planar surfaces. <coughs> and an actual frame. So it's more contained as the horse goes into the underworld. And I think the reason I did that was because... And then I echoed it underneath where there's, you know, black, white, black, white, black, white, going, disappearing below the surface of the picture. And the fingers are hanging in the dark as well. So that's why, I mean, this subject matter is the horse needs to go all the way over, not dangle in the dark, if you know what I mean. It's like horse hair, it hit the wind in the outside world. I have the horizon line where the wind is blowing and it, the horse's tail is reacting to the wind. And then this is the underworld. And this figure, I don't know where I got this out of. It's a stuffed pillow head. And the hands is playing cat's cradle. And the legs on these rockers. The horse's legs dangling in space. I got that from jumping. The horse is jumping. Here's the ear and the eye and the, the hips. And then the rib cage is sort of around it. And this drum like shape, I don't know where I got that from. And this, these are all, and then this thing I do with this folded, chattering, paper like forms. I have no idea where it came from. I was in a trance when I did this. But this colors, it all works. Show the underworld, things are happening down there that we don't quite know about. But you know those circles that Marshall was putting on people's arms? There's one right there. And I didn't, I know about what he was doing when I did that. I have no idea what Marshall would make this work. I have no idea what he would say. It's, I just, it, it just came to me. I followed the images and it just came to me. The people and the horse's head are coming over the top. And there's a horse's head there in brown and then there's one in black underneath. You see it? The eye. Right there, yeah. This is the head and the ear and the front legs that are dangling in space. And this person is playing cat's cradle with the hands. Cat's cradle. It's when you do this and it gets tighter and tighter. And it's, you know, it's about obstacles and rocking and falling. Rocking and obstacles and falling. Yeah. And dangling in space, those front legs. The horses like to look very vulnerable. Ah, they, uh, they are vulnerable, yeah. That's how most racehorses end their lives. They crack their legs. That's right. I have one in the barn right now. And I should talk about all these. This is the same thing with the surficial planar uh, folds or signature or language, something. And the horse is there with the legs dangling in the dark, and then there's a figure pointing upward, and it looks like there's microphones in front of them. It's like a warning shot. This drawing is a chalk drawing. Did this image come from a dream, or is no. it a dreamlike image that was built from fragments of your... Well, I had the horse yeah. going over jumps in the Grand National. I read National Velvet, which meant a lot to me, that book. Mm -hmm. And the horse, you're galloping up to a jump, you can't see the other side. 
just like life, you can't see what's going to happen. And then you go over and down. Mm. And to me, that over and down from the surface, which is like that, is important. And I, this figure that looks like they're in a stadium or something, but it's a warning person, a person who is warning. Mm -hmm. What is he warning about? The danger of the of this it's attempt. Just warning, warning. You know, sometimes is is the Cassandra complex. You know, it doesn't. No one listens. And all that background unfolding is building this image. And this flat planes in the back, see? It could either be a square, or it could be, you know, it's, it's up to the imagination of the looker. Yeah. Through. The horse's form is kind of breaking through. Oh, my God. And the child. Yeah, that's a child. That's a child warming, really. Okay, that's good. This is zoomed close, where the horse is coming down, and there is that sliding edge of the edge of the landscape where it hits the sky, and there's a horse and rider sliding down. But this horse is in close proximity to the looker. And it's quite simple, actually. It has to do with these other images. You know, it's, it's the workhorse with those big joints and big noses and big <laughs> forms. So the title more or less explains it. Okay? Is there a small little human figure? Yes. Okay. Figure on a horse galloping down, the, uh -huh. sliding down that. Okay. This is a three-plate intaglio, and it's a lot of, that was a big printing job, the three plates. And I read a German poem, I can't remember who it was by now, but of a person galloping over a lake that was frozen, and they looked back, as soon as they looked back, they fell through and died. Hmm. Okay, so this is me looking back and falling and dying. This is me. This is Dorgan, this is Benjamin, and this is Jim. Oh. And here's the highway with the car and the lights. This is the figure dying. This is a figure laying already dead, some man on the road. These mm. are these horses in a state of turnaround. This is a window with a ghost sliding down. Uh. So it's all about the overworld and the underworld. And this is the other half of that window oh. where the figure's already dead. And see, the horse has blinders on, and this netting is in The horse is breaking out of this encaptured netting. Wow. So it's about peril and the road and whatever else you can make out of it. But that's my family, and that's that. And the horse is turning around. The horse what? is galloping onward to break out of the netting. It's not turning. Mm. No, I mean those small images on, to the right. Oh, and the other the horses gathered like a like a wheel generating energy. Mm-hmm. Generating energy for yeah. change, for liberation itself, or uh, for yeah, their something own. something like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Living in New York at the time, I was separated from my husband, and this friend moved into the building. Or my teacher lived downstairs, and he lived down there with him. And he, he was a man I've always known since the 50s. He was Norwegian, gunnered. And he would decide to go back to his wife, and he was free. And I had to go back to Jim, and I'm in harness, going into this trench in New York. And I was in pain, and that horse with the harness is me. Actually, uh -huh. Picasso said, the body of the horse is the woman. Or the woman is the body of the horse. Us women get strapped into, in that time, you guys probably don't have that experience, but 
you had no really, you had to cook and clean and do dishes. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And I hated living in New York. It was like a prison. But I had to, I had to be away. But my teacher lived downstairs and, you know, he was, he was like my father. Your teacher in Marshall. Father. Yeah. He was born the same year as my father, 1902, poor father. My father had committed suicide by then, by the time I did these things. This is after I was, I was divorcing him, so I was free. These two really should go together, it's perfect. Um, the horse is coming out of the trench, but it's carrying death. See that black square in the back? Mm -hmm. It's coming out. This is an intaglio that I worked with wine and rosin. Get that bubbly effect. Wine and rosin? Yeah. Is that an ancient uh, Renaissance no, recipe or something? No, don't get your hopes up. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's something that we worked on and experimented with in the studio. And it worked in this case. Rosin is, you know, that powder. And you adhere it to the plate with heat. You have to be very careful that it doesn't all melt together and become shellac. But you mix it with wine and it kind of separates it. It's very much like marbling hmm. paper. Where you have all these little forms and they bubble around. If you look closely at this... It isn't a black aqua tint like this. This is, this is a straight aqua tint. But I think it has some wine in it too. It's looking a little more. Where's. What about like mm. right in here? It's speckles. Yeah, and this is an engraving actually. This horse. I engraved it with a tool. It's not an etched line. And this shape. Um, reoccurs because of me playing with Tinker Toys as a kid. Yeah, Those so how do you mean? Snakes. That yeah. shape around death looks like a kite. Oh. <coughs> death kite. But these, this is coming out and that, this one's going in. These two, I'm glad they're filmed together because mm -hmm. they're forward and backward. Okay. Well, here's a figure on a horse that's turned into uh, a long pole with back and legs and mane and chest cavity and coming down from a jump and it goes with journey into falling in that the figure is being sliced in half eventually. But the horse breaks loose like the other horse did not. Mm -hmm. But these, this kind of windshield wiper gesture I'm using is part of it from being behind glass, being catapulted into something that you're encased in and you can't get out, so you turn on the windshield wipers. Clarify the no. storm of your own life. I didn't go that far in the metaphor. It's an expression of it. It's a figure is still, you know, carved into somewhat by the horse, but not carved into in pain. It's the the journey, the two of them together, the two figures, and the figure is armless. You'll notice, and then the background is. The windshield wipers and the city back there, with those things, and the trench bringing the figures down into, into V. But there is a slight opening at the bottom. Yeah, there's a sense of a way out, a way through. Yeah, a way out is through, definitely. And it looks like there's an aqueduct in the back. That's the sort of the city, uh, the uh, aqueduct. You get it? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so it's it's almost like coming through the void. There's so right the darkness. There's so much darkness surrounding it. Yeah. The void. Mm. This is 
the cowboy series, Brave Cowboy, running from capitalism and digitalization. It's going into hit by an unseen source and the horse's legs get all twisted. Oh, God. <coughs> See, I do a force like this and then I have that opposing force, that line at the top that comes down. I seem to do that. I don't know why. I work from my unconscious. The forms that are in my head are there and then I break them up and move them around. They're all turning into falling, but, or into smithereens. <laughs> Exploded wow. fragments. And they broke through the ice, <gasps> and they, they never, never saw the horses again. <gasps> well, many years later, after my grandfather was dead, I was sitting up on Nichols Ledge. There were other people there, oh. and, I, and I heard a person telling another person that same story. Uh -huh. The horses going through the ice. Uh. They couldn't find their way out again once no, they had No, I mean, the logs were hooked to them, but the whole thing went through. Oh. The guy that was riding the logs managed to jump clear, but, so he was... I shouldn't do that with horses, period. That's terrible. There's a novel called Lone Cowboy by... Do uh, you know who it's by? I can't remember right now. The movie is set up so that there's a guy in a truck and he's driving along. And then there's a guy on a horse who's escaping modern life. You know, he just wants to be with his horse and his girlfriend or his wife is trying to bring him back home and he doesn't want to, he's trying to leave. And of course the two come together and he and the horse are killed. And that whole thing, of, you don't see the truck, but it's modern life or something hitting those figures. Hmm. And the horse's helpless feet, you know, in this trench, zooming backwards. And the reins are this way, the hands are chattering into the background. You see that chatter behind the hands? It's like what you just told me, in a way. Mm -hmm. Falling through the surface of the earth, which is all around there, stretched like that. That's a chalk drawing. Mm -hmm. But it's also about industrialization as opposed to the more ancient ways of yeah. doing things, right? And how, now here, uh, Michael was just talking about the drowning of those poor animals because there was no other way for the logger to work in the winter. And that was the common practice in Vermont, obviously, at the time in the winter. And, no, and no other way to get the logs out. Either. No other way to, that's, to get the logs out. Terrain to go through in the... Yeah. <clears throat> and, and you're talking about the other type of disaster which which has to do with industrialization coming and crashing in and taking over everything and destroying all those other natural possibilities. It's like the horse whisperer. That's what that story reminds me of. Remember when the tractor trailer car runs into the girl with the horse? No. This is a drawing to extend the series when the cowboy has bare feet and one foot is up there by the horse and the other one's hanging down here, so he's probably going to fall. And he has no hat now, and he's hanging in space, and the horse is being tortured by his mouth. And the guy's holding the reins. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. You did it? Mm -hmm. yeah. This painting, the trench has appeared. And the horse's foot becomes a circle with an X in it because the horse's feet seem so vulnerable to the world. And I, I turned it facing you so you know that this is a disaster and the red blood is coming. And again, in the sky, there's a meteor 
flagpole that oppose that adds to the trench shape and divides the sky in half. And that's all I can say that this thing is happening to these figures. And his hands are helpless now. There's no reins. Okay? Okay. Now we'll go look at that portfolio. This goes with what I call the cowboy series and this is sort of the last one. It's they're gone. They're they're dead. The horse's head is turned around in kind of a contorted way. And there are these strange underground figures that are like people or horses hind ends. I don't know. It's ah, fragments. This is a horse, the tail and the ear turned into a fish. This is like a man bending over with two arms, but I don't know if I intended it for that, but that's what it looks like. And, and there's this, small radiant pole that in, in interaction with this horizon line and this water of ground, I somehow needed that and it smears part of the horse's eye down. It's sort of a stabilizing form what's happening there and it's very understated. And there's this part here that's little smudgy chalk I put in there to connect him with this rod. So there it is. That's, that's probably the last image in that series. That's what it should be. Ready? Uh, this was in the spring of 1959. I had been on a runaway for nine months. So I went back to the Art Students League to, to be with George Gross, uh, who was my teacher's, Marshall's teacher. And he was at the, in the end of burnout teaching at the Art Students League. And so all he wanted to do was take me out to lunch at uh, Carnegie Hall, when they have a restaurant there, and talk. He just wanted to talk to me about Marshall and just talk to me. He was so lonely and he was drinking and he was depressed and he only lived about four more months after that. So I'm glad I got a drawing of him at least. And he's teaching and he's really using his arms and his gestures a lot. And I'm glad I caught that. He was a funny guy. He always dressed in a shirt and tie and a suit. That was his costume protect himself from the world, I guess. He grew up in a kind of a restaurant and he knew how to serve people uh -huh. with a towel over his arm. Oh, uh -huh. he was a jokester. That suit and tie routine was part of his joke. He's always dressing in costumes, always. He was dadaing the dadas. Uh. Right. I entitled this Corridor and it should have been titled Zigzag. You see some of the remnants of my other work are there. The horse with the harness going up a long narrow thing. The head is way at the top with some guy with a hat and there's another horse's head way up there. And then there's a woman standing with a pail doing an invisible dance with someone else. Another person on their <coughs> stairs and this folded um, texture. And this horse's leg, I don't know which it belongs to, but it doesn't really matter. This is this horse here with the head and the face and the bit. And this one, the horse has the blinders. And there's another horse up there. They're all being jammed into a trench. Okay. I did this painting in 1958 when I was living on Canal Street. <clears throat> and I was living in a black time. And the horse image arching over felt like a protective spirit. And the little red thing on the upper left corner is kind of like the occlusion of the light. The light comes from beneath the horse. And the other horses are running free. And this horse has just got 
this spiritual task to do. Okay? Tell me more about that horse, that huge horse. It seems protective or it seems like it's the spirit of the other horses. It's an overarching um, spiritual presence. And the sky is coming into the rib cage, as you can see on the top. The sky is coming into the rib cage. Yeah. The connection with the, the, the celestial beings. <laughs> see that squiggle at the top is similar to what's happening in that other painting that was done 20 years later. You notice that? Hmm. I just noticed that. I see that sky pattern in much of your work. Yeah. That it's like a striated cloud, like a stratus cloud, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that has action in it, has a movement in it, it's moving quickly. Yeah. This is sort of my autobiography. When I was a kid, I looked just like that, and I would take my horse and go for miles and miles. And I think I got the idea of cutting the plate like that. So it's just me and the horse, and then the one in the middle is the black and white one of me coming back from childhood into old age. Right? I wear glasses that I have my portfolio. And the horse is not saddled, it's just there. And what I did is I printed this, and then I moved it out without re-inking it, like that. And then I printed this for the middle, and then I printed this, and I moved it out and ghost printed it. So it's oh, now, it, it, it worked. It's cinematographic. And the sky changed in the old age one. <laughs> the, the unseen, unseen sky. Oops. And the middle one is a tombstone every mile. But I have writing that I wrote down about all these things. Okay? Well, I see the image of this horse, like the one we just did, though I did this in the 70s. Is got that this um, strange eye like the red sun in the other one. I just noticed that that's kind of of mystical proportion. That this horse is coming through a doorway. Here's his hip, his hind leg, and the front legs are slanted. He's falling, but he's somewhat steady. And he's looking back. You see the eye and the ear and the mane and the collar. Can you see the horse? Yes. And he's coming through a door, but he's looking back. Or she is looking back. The look back yeah. problem. The light is in the back, and the horse is falling into darkness. The logical forms that are archetypal, of yes, archetypal that's resonance. True. That's true. That's true. Then it has, a, it has a personal meaning to you, it's psychologically. Yeah. If we take the horse as the body of the woman, of your womanhood, it means that you were working with something that's very deep. It's very deep. But also, see the, those forms at the door in, in the cut in? Uh, th that's appearing in my work in a lot of other places. I don't know what it is. It's like pages of books or covers or doorways. So I call that one crashing through. What about this? Oh yeah, because this one was the simplified one that your teacher asked you to he simplify, was right. right? He was right. Okay, you ready for me to talk to her? Yeah, no. Okay. This is Omen itself, and to me this is, from all my many drawings of workhorses, this is a doorway figure. This is the beginning of the doorway. And it's holding a flag that has pieces of my emotional history in, in the back on it. And it's just present. It's itself. Okay. 
this is based, this is called Unseen, Unseen. This is about atomic war. And it's based on a poem that Lynn wrote, which I should attach to the back of it. You see, the horse, again, is a reactor. And there's a horse ghost rising like, from the dead on the right-hand corner. And in the poem, the, co the cows fall from the sky and the birds are falling from the sky. And the landscape in the back has got this seam that came out almost by accident right here, which was perfect for what I was trying to do. All this stuff just happened. And all this, it, it just worked. I was so happy. And strictly black and white print. But it said all it needed to say. Yeah, I really love the texture. Yeah, the texture. Yeah. That's what you can do with Intaglio. It's so uh, great. Uh, Aquatent, particularly. It's got a watery effect. Once I discovered that, I never looked back. Mm -hmm. I never went back to woodcut or lithography. Mm -hmm. You can do this with lithography, but it's not as good. I found it to be very difficult. So that's it's a world turned inside out, and the horse is the reactor. And the horse is already losing its head, its neck, and the, the main part of the head is up there in death, in destruction of everything. And I particularly like what this little figure here, the darkness on either side. And the horse, this horse, comes down through this one. Do you see that line there? Uh-oh. And this here, this is a neckline, and it melts oh. into this figure that's being sort of decapitated and scared to death. That's what it looks like being scared to death. To oblivion. For some reason, I don't know, I started reading something in Norse mythology. Not from any spiritual connection at all, because I'm Celtic, not Norse. And we had a pony, and we called her Norns. And the Norns are the fates. These are the Norns. They're the fates. The grandchild, the old woman, the middle woman, and the child. And then there's like a mirror between them. Here's the back of the child, and the back of the grandmother, and the mother, the mother of the child, with their hands over her face. And this is the shadow of the Yggdrasil tree. And here it is reflected in this red globe here. And again, the horse is the only one that knows what's happening. Its head has appeared above the line into the regular world, and the rest of it is under the underworld. So the horse, this horse is running through. And these horses are running on top. And in the myth, there's a man named Yeg, Y-G-G. And the horse of the egg was important. And the Yggdrasil tree is spelled Y-G-G-D-R-A-S-I-L. Drasil is horse, as I understand it. And it's my theme of the under and the overworld. And the hammock-like shape is, reoccurs in my work all the time. But again, the horse is the one that's aware, because it's between the two worlds. Its head is arising above the ground line. And the Norns are underneath. They uh, arrange people, the people in the world's fates. But they're sort of consumed with responsibility now because they, they are emotional. Their hands are up and the little girls are quiet. They don't they really don't know what's going on. But the two women are aware in some measure. This is this print has been very popular. I've sold a lot of these, mm -hmm. but the plate got damaged in the fire. But I fixed it, and I have to reprint it. It's something I've been avoiding doing. Well, I got a job at Golden Gate Fields at, at the track as a, a groom and a horse walker. And the main emotional thing to me is a horse goes out alone to face 
this terrific circle where they are used as slaves. And the ghost horses are already out there, and then there's a, 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 a round orbital figure signal of the track is a circle, which they're actually ovals, but it doesn't matter. There's horses up there, and they, these are the betters' hands, the greed, and the wanting paper. What's on paper is going to make them win. And that's what, what it's all about, human hands that ruin horses' lives. And the people down there shouting and carrying on, making a lot of noise. So it's quite simple. I have a lot more on this theme. I, want to, I don't know which one I did first. I think, I don't know. But the, I think I did this one first. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. But there is the hands holding the cards or the, or the racing tickets and the goggles, the camera-like things, and echoed with the two circles. And the horse's legs are under that horizon line. It's a kind of a decapitation. <laughs> it's also those circles are rolling back and forth and chopping horses to bits. Oh. It's not about justice. There's really no justice for animals, really. Very rarely happens. But this is, it's cooked down to the essentials. When you do all these drawings and stuff, and then you start doing a print, it condenses it. It's like cooking it. It's cooked. Down to the essentials. See that jockey on the right is covering the horse's eyes with his hands. See that? Horse is here, jockey. Gaggy standing up in his stirrups, and this is horse, saddle and a bridle, but no jockey. And there's a set of a skeleton on the horse here, and these are people. The dead are under here. These strange clown-like faces and women's bodies, and the horses are still running around, and the hands are controlling them. I have a good piece of writing I did about this. I said that the hands pinch and piano, pinch and piano, and a word came to me. They pinched, they're pulling out the track like it's so much knitting. They're in control. Their version of reality. Yeah. Insect Palace presides, and jockeys look like insects because they've got these goggles and they have these grasping hands with whips, and the horses are dried out on the, this rack here. They have to go around in circles when, after they bathe them, after they run. Here they are running and kind of disappearing, and this is the stadium, <laughs> like a big rat trap. And there's a jockey with the lines radiating outward. And there's a horse that looked very happy. Is that, is that good enough? I mean, it's quite obvious. But also, the shapes of the track in the stadium kind of look like a clam about to shut. Hmm. You know, I've got, I've got clam shapes, shapes. Yeah, you change perspective. As you can see, there's two plates on this. The bluish one and the red one. See, this is quite different looking. It's not so harsh. Because the color is green and the blue. It's the same subject matter, really. I mean, Flanagan came out of the barn this morning, and you should have seen him bucking and running in circles. The thoroughbred horse is really something. 
in action. They're beautiful. They just mm -hmm. flow with m m movement. Got that one. Got that one? Yep. Well, I did this after being blocked for a long time. And I had been wor started working at the track. And this just was what all I fantasized was to letting all those horses out. <laughs> and have, they're always, their legs are always bandaged. I think the bandage thing comes out in those other drawings I did with the bandaged background. See? And the horses are in those barns That's where I used to work. And you had to go to the shed row. You go around the shed row with the horses. And there's that evil stadium. And the horses running like hell. Get away. It's very simple, really. And there's some scattered bits in the darkness. And the horse is coming out of the darkness. There's some et etched lines in this. Uh, you know, the horse and the muzzle. But this is basically an aqua tint that I scraped. Hmm. I scraped out the whites, scraped them up. The whole plate was aqua tinted. And then I started with the scraper to pull up the whites. I get this, and, I had, and then I, I had etched these little lines in. They're faint. So, and it was a big relief to do that. I'm glad I did it. The drying rack. The horses are being dried out. And the black in the background is a monoprint. I made, and I think it's good because it shows some kind of rebellious gestures in the background. <laughs> rebellious gestures in the background. <laughs> On the horizon line. And the horses, they, I got them right because they're half asleep and they're just hanging out there like laundry. <sighs> The drawing rack looks like those laundry things that people used to have, which I've never liked. My grandmother used to have one. Yeah. yeah. And it reminds me of those things they have in the East, where the animals are tied, and they go around and around oh, and around like and pump water in pump Iraq. Water. Yeah. yeah, Iraq. Grain, uh, grain, grain, and you're on, and they to just walk around and around and around, uh, whether they're horses or oxen or. See, with etching, you can press fabric into the wax, I mean, the ink, and then you pull it up and you get that. Mm -hmm. You done? Mm -hmm. This is Journey into Falling, where the woman crosses the frozen lake and looks back and falls dead from the horse because of looking back. So it's called Don't Look Back. But this was a preliminary drawing I did. And, uh, and as the figure falls, there's faces coming down into the mist. Um, I think it's dead people. Because before I did it with my family that I lost with divorce and them growing up and stuff. But I was without family or home when I left Vermont. I didn't have, I didn't have that anymore. So I was literally being cut in half. Not by the horse, but by what I was remembering. All right, this is... What I said before about the woman galloping over a frozen lake. And there is a galloping figure in the background, kind of on a warning post. And the triangles are the ice cracking. And she falls back into death. And the horse keeps going. Even though the horse, ha the horse has blinders on. And it's that wonderful color is ice breaking. And it's... It's transparent and opaque at the same time. And these figures are falling backward here. There's skulls, people with hats, strange people. But it doesn't have that window sliding down like the other one does. And there's these 
sky circles. And this, this is this is one of my best prints, I think. And the woman is being cut in half by the horse, in a way, not cut, but she's submerged in the horse, so the legs are coming on both sides, you see? Like here, this is like an x-ray foot, and there's the line, and this foot is flesh-like, and it's, and here's a face upside down, and this is the arm, this is a self-portrait actually. What would you call, what do you call that color? Payne's gray. There's something about that. Oh, I know, I use it all the time, it's great. And I've got to reprint something, so I have to mix it up again. Okay. See, I mix my own colors mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. All right. So this it was excruciatingly hard. It took hours and hours. I don't think I'd ever get involved in that again. <laughs> <laughs> No two Beautiful. versions of this. Well, I actually we did 36 prints. It's about based on a poem by Lynn of the horses getting free of the merry-go-round. So it's quite simple, really. Like the turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> but you know those poles. You know they they probably had like, the ones that emerged in the cowboy series. Probably that's where it came from. Maybe that these. Horses are turning and there's a pole. See what I mean? And this is just one. There's no series or anything. So. And it's also the childhood dream of the merry-go-round and how the horses come alive and how you want them to be alive and how you want to just take off. Take off. <laughs> yeah. This is um, my interest in steeplechasing. This is the over-under series where you can't see the other side of the jump. And this horse is falling down into the underworld. And the other one's on top and it's showing what he had just done, or she. And the horse is not ridden, it's just a... It's a monoprint done on a piece of zinc with just paint in my fingers. All of them are... You can say I can say the same things about all of them. There's about three, I think. Three of them. Uh, three that are framed anyway. Yeah, probably had more in a drawer somewhere. If I'd help me. <laughs> <laughs> this is over under number three. Over under falling. The horses cascade down. And there's one coming, and then there's a head of another one. One of the big influences of my life is National Velvet, where she and she was a star, a working class family in England, south southern England. Horses were her life, and she inherited this horse at a, at a, at a, a village lottery. It's a black and white horse that jumped at everything. It was called a piebald, and she called him the pie. And she dressed as a man so she could ride him in the race, and the guy that worked for her father in the slaughterhouse had been around the track up north, which is, Aintree is a famous jump in that race. And here's a horse just coming down, just by himself. He's velvet, you can't see her. She's she was a very ethereal person. And she won the race, but she fell off the horse because she had a bad, very weak stomach. It was all too much for her. And she, and of course, then he was disqualified. The rider has to stay on the horse oh. at the end. Oh. But it came out so well, just black and white. And this is a monoprint. Monotype, I mean. Monotype has no nothing on the plate. It's just same plate printed all those other two. They just, you know, cleaned it off and did another one. This is entitled Ghosts Over Aintree. Mm -hmm. 
And it is a monotype also, but I cut that horse out of paper. And the other... What horse? Which the white horse. Oh, there. oh. And I put the, the paper horse on there. And the face of the horse had ink on it. I don't know how I did that. I can't remember. But it's either glued on or it's not. But then there's two plates, you see, it, and it connected with a line of the racetrack or the jump, whatever you want to call it. It's like a collage when you cut out. And, and the, short, the shorty shirt is just full of that. Okay. This horse shorty that I had, I cut out of paper the shape. You can see the horse's shape. And I did this series of prints coming from Shorty's terror of what he had lived through as a pulling horse in a fair. And his whole shoulders were pulled back, you know, distorted. And he had a lot of issues, but we just loved him here. He was a wonderful horse. Oh, I fooled around with cutouts and different things, elements. As you can see, it's just very simple. This one is just called Shorty. It's the first one. Is there a reflection? Is there a reflection of Shorty in, in that? A reflection? In oh yeah, you're right. It is reflected upside yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be either this and, horse or that horse. And this one is this one, but going, moving forward. Yeah. And then you pick up, here's a piece of uh, paper, uh, fabric moved across it later. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good for you, Once girl. you read this, once you start reading it. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. It's a, it is a, like a series of revelations to begin to uh, comprehend your work, to get, you know, to begin to... Uh, understand your language yeah. your uh, language as a visual artist okay this one is shorty under, under. Yeah. that darkening sky yeah. huh. shorty illuminate <laughs> like he's on fire. Mm. Those are his fears. That's what he's really like in real life. And if you ran around in front of him and talked to him, he was he would not charge ahead. Because he was if he heard the ring hit the hook, if you're pulling a log with him, he would go crazy. Because that's when they used to stab him with a pen knife and mm. electric shocks to make him jump forward into the harness to mm. rip the load out. Oh. It's terrible what they did to him. But he got calmed down here. He, got, he was happy here for five years. This is called Shorty Untrapped. He's coming out of the darkness and the pain. This is Shorty Emerging. See, it's like a big trap. This one is called Blind Turn. That's horse's head is sort of a dark, blinded side. These are just studies I did with a palette knife from all the horses I've been drawing up in New Hampshire, work horses mostly. I got into their joints. This is part of what I call a pylon series. There's a horse with a rider on it at the top, and then there's a great big horse, work horse with a big feet here with sort of TV screens in the middle of him and this woman's head and hand coming out of like a, a shutter box. It's just some images that are inside me that came out in this way. That's all I can say. So this is another one in which there are images that, that appear, yeah. uh, that are coming forward. Are they backlogged? Are they images that 
want to come through from the past, or are they paintings that need to be made, or are they, uh, or They're not nothing that needs to be made. It's made, and it has meaning for, to me. Of my constant themes of the horse, the body of the woman, the landscape on top, and the underneath part. Mm -hmm. and this horse is stepping into the underneath part. And the way they merge into yeah. each other, the woman yeah. and the horse. The back, and forth, and the horse yeah. and back and forth, mm -hmm. yeah. This is um, an addition to the one before it. The horse is now not stepping out, but is it within this scene of boxes and and TV screens and and I don't know. Excuse me. The, the massiveness of the horse kind of holds it together, yet it is tearing the horse apart. Do you see what I mean? But the pictures coming forward in these slotted lines, portrayal and disarray. I was reading um, Herzog, and there's this wonderful quote about pylon to see if it could be possible moving forward in life. This is one of my first trial prints of it. The basic structure of the images is here. And this dog appeared. And he asked it in the, in the print, it was a foul bite, but it works. And this figure also appeared. And see, some of these lines are engraved lines. When they're very clean like this, it's a felony, engraving tool. And this, I put some brown in here, but it's basically this kind of magenta, okay? This is just the first one. And there's Aquahead here. And these lines, and these eyes are like one, two, three, four, five, six eyes, three figures. And these piled up faces, and there's, you know, three horses. Here's a horse, here's an eye, and an ear, and horses, the head sticking out. But when I did the plate, the head was facing this way. See, it's always, it comes out backwards. It's always a shot when you print it. But what? I didn't do it that way. So in my subsequent pylon series, the horse's head is always facing to the right. When it's people piling onto horses to get somewhere in their journey, and I did this as a miracle, you know what it took. See, this is overprinted in a dark umber, over that red. Mm -hmm. I was just lucky to get it on paper because it's exactly what I meant. And actually, Wayne State University took one of these prints for their collection. Mm -hmm. That was an honor. Could you tell us something about the intentionality of your line, of your of uh, your gesture? Yeah, I, and, and well, and yes, I can. Yeah. I did an etching of for uh, a poem of birth, and I had the woman, that woman like the Waldorf Venus, and I had this kind of tendril coming out. So when I was working on this series, I remember that. And see, the pile on the horse's head is sticking out to the right, white. And here, eyes. Hmm. And the head is un unstated. Here is a cheekbone. It's the two eyes. And then over here is the hips of a starving horse. Hmm. And it's orchestrated. And this is somebody's arm. And eyes, a human who had leaned over this horse and is looking at this horse and is leaning on top of it and it all twirls down into this amniotic hmm. amniotic gesture. Here's some more of my stack angles. That's all I can say. It just came out of all that work.
Can you see it? I was a kid who had terrible, terrible tantrums, and I looked like that to my parents and to me. I could, I could see the horror on their face. And this, this is, this is me connected with this sort of somber. And this is me after my cesarean, which dragged me into grayness. And this is my old self. And these hooks, I don't know, I put them in these paintings. They have to do with pain and meat hanging. That's all I can say. So they appeared. And this, you've seen this in my paintings, this doorway line and a window. And that's it. That's pretty much it. There is, uh, can you tell us how the oh, series I began? Did, I did the painting experience in California where you just had a piece of paper and you had paint and it was a room full of strangers and I, you just painted. You didn't talk, you didn't, you didn't analyze it, what you've done, you just put it out there and it's poster paint, which is something I don't particularly like, but it does get to the heart of things with the energy and the opacity. So that's this, you'll see this kind of thing again, you know, in these other ones. Okay. But it's, you know, it's, it was very, very scary for me to do this. I couldn't think I could do it because the silence and with strangers and all that. But I got into it. It took me three months of going there every week. Did you say that this was a your an inner child? Well, all journey, the images that, that we repress in our daily life, that's what they're like. They're not beautiful, they're not artistic. They're impact. That's what they are. Impact and opening the secret door to feelings. Impact. I'll, ta I'll keep talking with the other ones. Well, these, this is a reoccurring shape, you know, the, like the racetrack. And these insect terror images. And there's a h horse, a rider, going down. And these people and carriages with posters and signs. I really don't know what this means, but this just came out automatically. I think what scares me most is facelessness and expressionlessness on people's, with people. And, and this is what they're chattering and they're talking about in these posters. And it's kind of like a bubble that's going to burst underneath. I probably started with this brown swatch and then I put people ascending with candles, with faces, with horrible flesh-colored elongated eyes and the, sn the snake is going down and it's about eyes and darkness and light and there's the eyeball with the blood in it and then these human figures marching downward under the earth or something. I, it's not rational so it's hard for me to talk about it. It says what it is so clearly to me. That makes sense, Jerome. Emotional. It's all emotional. Emotional charge. Yeah. yeah. That's what you mean by impact, huh? Is yeah. that what you mean by impact? Emotional yeah. charge. That that's like pre-thought. This image is about birth, and these are sperms. It looks like to me, and birth and death. And I did not want to be born to that mother I was born to. And I was screaming when I was born, and I was yellow. I was born yellow with the ring of hair on my, one of my legs and a hair down to here. Lovely sight. <laughs> and see, there's the horse's legs underneath the grass horses, and me on a horse that we're all turning into grass. But mm. this person, this baby, is surviving with the umbilical cords, falling down into life. 
unwilling and screaming. And the skeleton? The skeleton is being pulled up because it's what's next. Hmm. <laughs> Birth and death. <laughs> the inner snake and these are figures with instructions and the screaming babies in the center and it's exploding outward with the placenta and the blood and the skulls waiting in the background and you know it's automatic painting I can't really say more than that. This is it. My, it's also my horror of the adult world. I think you, you, have you ever seen this before? These came from the cards in Alice in Wonderland, I think. They're just like this and they're these figures that are holding up playing cards. That's all I can think of when I saw it. And then these are these chattering hands that you saw in the cowboy ones, which uh, I did way before this. I did this when I was about to leave California. Which was what year? 92. Mm -hmm. So there's me as this angry child, full of fear. I was, I was full of fear and descending on me, these faceless people. and. This blankness, that is what's frightening. And this wordlessness, silence, and doom. <laughs> so that's it. And the expectation that you're going to conform to all of this, too. These are the social norms that so, you're expected to. Something like that. Well, <clears throat> the figure's at the top, and there's ghosts on either side that look like those cards. They are like comical characters who are manipulating these masks, which is something I'm really afraid of. Because the masks and the silences and the lies in my family. So they're lowering the masks down to cover me or something. But they're comical and they're kind of lovable characters. And it's, it's just a simple statement. I have a painting of being under the dining room table with the adult's legs and I'm lying on the floor. And I don't know where it is because it's not there. But this is a mass that's <sighs> terrible. Now this is, this is a rhinoceros and that's an elephant. One facing this way with the trunk and the other one in the back. These are, I don't know, wildebeest or something a horse and this is a tree that's alive this is a dead tree hanging down and these are the live, live leaves penetrating it's my need to flee the city also is in here and these are you know people's you can see their apartments when you uh, drive by you're driving by all the time and there's these win empty windows and empty, lifeless world underneath. Underneath the pavement. Yeah, yeah underneath the pavement. All right. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Well, this is the child's rage and fear back and forth, back and forth. And that's what the hair symbolizes in the mouth and the hands. One is dripping and the other one is pink, but it's just rage and fear and one figure.
Well, there are the masks, and some of them look like cars, that car shape, which I never noticed before. And here's the angry child's hair sinking, and here's the squares pushing down. And these are, you know, paper cutouts of people that live in connection. And this is the disconnected, the angry, and, and the fearsome. And the masks. The, these are the happy people, and these are the masks that are going to cover this one up that she's so afraid of. And these doors and windows <sighs> coming in. Huh. Those cars are also like masks. They're masks, really. They're and masks. I they're, painted them as masks, but uh, as I looked at them from back there, they look like cars. Uh, uh. They also look like alien beings, yeah. uh, right, floating in there, and they're 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 uh, threatening. There's a, they're, they're, the blackness of the eyes, yeah. or the blankness of the eyes, are yeah. threatening. Yeah. But, yeah. Exactly. So, invasion of the body snatchers. You ever see that movie? Yeah. Most terrifying thing are those pods. <laughs> The snake is rounding the curve of the earth, maybe, or of the world, like that other one. And here's these flags that the skeletons are holding. See, this is a more complete one, and this is from my years in New York subway. And these, these crosses are going down. The, the, this person is holding them up, and these faces are sort of peaceful, and then, and then there's a skull, and these crowded pieces, they're crowded with each other. And it's from being in the subway a long, lot, many times. I just jumped into it. I can tell I did this first, and I made these shuffling squares. Hmm. They all, this stuff reappears in my other work all the time. Is that a platform? Is that the, that's the subway platform, right? Yeah. yeah. And then. And so you could jump down there. You could. I was very suicidal when I was living in New York, and I thought about jumping in front of the train a lot. I didn't do it. So. You kind of go into a trance when you do this. You're not conscious, and it comes out. Hmm. But. And this kind of painting, there are no, there are no mistakes, because you don't pre-plan anything. Okay? There's the angry child doing a dance, and there's a reflection in the grass. And here comes the door, and the wheel with the what do you call it? the treads inside and the child's being squished this way but it's still happily dancing this one is crying is aware but being overcome I see that shape I, I use it all the time the door opening shape slamming doors See these, this is in a circle, this is, this is a figure, I think, I don't really quite know. And this is happiness in here, and this is awareness and sadness. Dripping blue blood down, yeah, okay? Mm -hmm. So I was in New York and I was separated from my husband and I would go down to the 42nd Street movie theaters and draw 
I was like going to work. And I did lots of drawings of these people asleep, snoring, rolling beer bottles down the aisle. And I called it Mariners because it's a lot like their waves are on a ship. But the screen is empty. There's a few people walking here among the ocean of seats. And these sweeping balconies and arches. And these were the people that were probably homeless and cold and hungry. And they're all sleeping. And it's like the dream of sailing on a ship that was holding them. The movie theater was their ship holding them in some kind of security and warmth. That's why I love Samuel Beckett, because that really hit, hit the nail on the head for me, that theater. The Lost Souls. This is the stairway in a boarding house I stayed in in 1958, Mrs. Costagini. And this was the most wonderful, as you can see. And it's a very hard thing to do, but I did it. And it was, it was nice being there for $10 a week. <laughs> and it was something that held me together. As I, I was working as a waitress six days a week, and I would go there, and I lived there, and I would paint. It was an old house. And her father was a painter that did murals in Washington. Italian, uh -huh. less. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did this drawing in 1956 while I was living in Wisconsin. I think it was at Marshall had left. I don't know if he had left when I did this or what, what but it just came to me. Partly because of the 1950s a time of silence and uh, oppressive conventionality. Things you didn't talk mm. about, mm. which is very present. And so this was like a dry heave to me. It was like something to do with lack of breathing, lack of motion. It was a void, it was empty. Then I did this painting right here, same year. I really concretized it and put it in color and hedged, hedged it in on the edges with these inks and, and watercolors and these little, little houses. In Madison, oh. there always was a Capitol building. It was in a lot of Marshall's work, always the Capitol. But mine was like a floating island of the city a little habitation or something. That's what it was for me. And mm. I think the void to me has something to do with my experience of being pregnant when the world came down on me very badly of the shame and the horror of being pregnant before marriage. And this At, was in what year that you became pregnant? 1953. Which was a very repressive time. Yeah, it was. Yeah, in America. So I did these two, and then then I did this one in 57. It was stretched out more than the other two. So it became more landscape. So and I just, I just think I let the paint carry me. But that same feeling of breathlessness was it's very claustrophobic and very rasping. And were you influenced by existential philosophy at that time? Were you influenced by Sartre's existentialism? I didn't have time. I was busy with pa babies and children. So, so really, you weren't. You weren't. Uh, Not really. It was just a. It was your own actual. Yes. Realization. It was it, this sense of the existential void, the existential despair. No, came out of my unconscious. Uh, out of I your was, unconscious. And I was very unconscious. So. 
Then this appeared. The, the woman on the horse. with this nice mauve color. And, and this appears in my work over and over again. There's a horse inside, and then there's a horse on the outside oh. that is stra has straps, has a bridle, has some strapping. And here's probably a self-porter, myself melting into a horse that's very ethereal. So is this the moment when the horse began to appear out of the void? Yeah, in and out of the void, right. And so this one is also dated? Uh, it isn't dated. I don't know when I did it. It was probably in the 50s, 50, I don't know, mm -hmm. the 57 or 8. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My life had radically changed by then. And then, then there was the horse over and in the sky when I, it was a time when I didn't have real horses in my life and I missed them terribly. And there, this is a painting I did of the horse over and the horse is running free underneath. And this mm. is a horse suffering. Oh. And this one doesn't even have a head. This was done in 58, when I was living on Canal Street in New York, uh, in the city, which I really hated being in the city. It was not my place. And I missed the horses, I missed the land, I missed everything. And things were very bad for me. And this horse, now the void appears almost in the shape of the, the body of the horse. Yeah. With a young horse, yeah, young almost horse. in the fetal position, would you? Is no, it's any... running. It's running. But there's still a womb-like feeling, no? Yeah, the horse is a womb, and that's. I guess that's what I wanted in this to have a horse over me, protecting me from the world. The world was pretty bad then. I had run away from my children and my husband because a very bad thing happened, and I just. I had to leave. I felt it was all my fault. And I had to leave and I went away down to Washington, D.C. I just got off the train there. I don't know why. I just, I was under some wicked spell or something. Anyway, this, this came out of that period. This I did in 1964 when I was in Detroit. No, I was in New York. I don't know how I ever did this. This is part of my cowboy series where this cowboy on a horse gets hit by a truck. Mm. But I put it in a circle. And here are the circular forms that are taking the breathing away and doing something with it. And this is where these forms that I developed very early when I was quite young into my major themes. I brought them into my major themes. This is one of them. I mm -hmm. call it the cowboy series. But this is very different than the cowboy images. But also what we're, we're saying is that there was an evolution from series of work to series of work in which Circle the, an overriding and a circular form which represents the void plane, comes through, continues yeah. to come through. Yeah. From series to series, yeah, over yeah. years and years. Yeah, this is the 60s. Okay. When I was in California, I worked at the racetrack, and I had a racetrack series. And this one, the title is Only Speed Flourishes. And here's the circle, and these horses are having to run in these ellipses and circles. And they're suffering because of it. And here's a skull and women being forced into something. 
I hear horses running away. And these buttons that are kind of evil coming down from the hands that are holding the bedding tickets and they're turning into skeletons. This is just a proof. The finished print has a pair of hand, a bunch of hands here. And this was done in Payne's Gray, my favorite color. And the horses are here. They're, they're engaged. They're not just floating. Hmm. They're engaged in working for men, providing entertainment or something. And they're being enslaved for that purpose. They're enslaved, yeah. Well, to me, a horse enslaved is like women enslaved. See, in this one, you see, this is a preliminary drawing. And this horse was on the right side with a jockey holding his hands over the horse's eyes and the ghost horses and this void-like circle like it's in that one. See, when you print, it's it comes out the other way. And here's the binoculars and the hands holding the tickets and these faint figures and horses running through the forms. And this circle here, there's a horse falling in here. Hmm. There's a horse running free, but there's, it fell. Uh, it's, a, it's trying to escape. This is the 1970s. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the circle began to come in as a more of a metaphor instead of a presence. And I use the metaphor in lots of different ways. This way, this way, and this way. <clears throat> and even in the upper reach, there's more circularity that happens with the, the, <clears throat> there, even here, so this arch, this incredible arch, is yeah. including a circularity. And then yeah. this then the perspective arch, is yeah. moving into it. Yeah, the horses are going over the top down the other side. See this horse's legs are hanging into this circle and this horse had fallen on its back. And here's a horse running free. Hmm. Yeah, this came out of my working at the racetrack. A lot of good things from that ex horrible experience of working in that factory. That's what it's like. Now please tell us a little bit more about the relationship of the horse to the body of the woman that you just mentioned? Well, they have to, they're Im imprisoned with saddles and bridles and control. They're controlled. And they don't have any right to freedom or expression. And I felt like that. I felt very much sympathy and, and empathy for a horse's life. And a red black beauty when I was quite young and that had a huge effect on me. And uh, that they have to be going in these see these circles. And circles. this looks like these are either stand up ghosts with no faces or mm. it looks like piano keys in a funny way. I don't really know, but I turned them into hands and another, when I finished mm. that print there, when I did the rest of it. And the human hand is controlling all these horses and everything. And those, those horses on the far side there, they, they got out of the circle, but they fell through the circle, another circle. Oh. A circle of days of, you know, you know, my life was very constrained with cooking, cleaning, taking care of the kids. I, I, I didn't have much of a life at all. I had Marshall who would bring over wonderful books when we talk about them. And he was doing his paintings and we talked about that. That was that was my one 
transfusion of real life. But this, I had gone beyond those child rearing days because I was that now in my 40s when I did this. This is a monotype I did. Jeez. Monotype is when you just paint on the etching plate and you run it through the press. And you use some turpentine and you, you have to work really fast. But the horse is now totally inside this kind of prenatal oval. And so the forms were inside me. So I just, this is a really quick piece of work. It's not nothing I planned like that. And it's also kind of the shape of, of the human eye. And here's a couple of faces here. Eyes and nose, mouth. And the pupil of the eye is the horse. Yeah. Escaping, coming through into the light, moving uh, into the future right. or into the present or Moving, and a woman is riding the horse. A woman. Mm. Yeah. But it's very, you know, you can see how I did it with a piece of cardboard or something like that, and then I did these with a brush. And in fact, it's a naked woman, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The void. I call this ocular arrival. Ocular arrival. That's a beautiful title. Yeah. That's exactly what you meant by it. And yeah. what is the date of this? Is this before or after the this? Previous? I did this. I think I did it here. I think I did it in the 90s. So it follows through from the 50s through the 90s. It's reappearing. Yeah. Oh. But earlier I had no horses. I was starving for horses, and mm. then I got some, and I had to give them up when I got divorced. And I had to get them again. Oh, I have them now. Now, Quick. in relation to the... Do you want to show something of the Beckett? Oh, yeah. Group? I'm afraid I can't get it back together. No, I wouldn't be able to. My favorite passages from Waiting for Godot. Here's the cover. I yeah. found this arm in the backyard in Oakland from a doll. You see how old it is? So yeah. I tied that on here. But here's a horse with this ghost person upside down falling off. These are the best passages from Waiting for Godot. And please read some of them. I will. Yeah. And, you know, the first one, Estragon says, there's nothing to be done. And Vladimir says, I'm beginning to come around to that opinion. All my life, I've tried to put it from me, saying, Vladimir, be sensible. You haven't yet tried everything. And I resume the struggle. So there you are again. Beckett, with the return and return, the same, saying the same thing again, makes a circle. And, and Estragon says, and we, and Didi says, I beg your pardon. I said, and we, Didi says, I don't understand. Where do we come in? Come in. <laughs> Take your time now. Come, come in on our hands and knees. I love that. It made fun of all these terrible things. Of the sense of utter emptiness and despair. Yeah, and here's Dee Dee and Go-Go again, and the pair of shoes they lost are here. Another actor on the play. 
And the last of this and passage. And there's a circle in that one. Yep. Yeah. You can't go barefoot, Dee Dee says. And Coco says, Christ did. Christ? What has Christ got to do with it? You're not going to compare yourself to Christ. All my life I've compared myself to him. But where we lived, it was warm and dry. Yes, and they crucified quick. There again is that feeling of, I just get the chills that's running down my legs right now. He says it at the end, and it, it puts a dot on things. Everything oozes, says Gogo. Look at the tree. It's never the same pus from one second to the next. The tree, look at the tree. And here, where are we now? Where else, do you think? Do you not recognize the place? Recognize? What is there to recognize? All my lousy life, I've crawled about in the mud. And you talk to me about scenery? Look at this muck heap. I've never stirred from it. Calm yourself. Calm yourself. You and your landscapes. Tell me about the worms. <sighs> that, that's like my philosophy right there. <laughs> the <laughs> negative is underneath somewhere. Something bad is happening. Andy says, mm. and where are we? And where were we yesterday evening according to you? How would I know? In another compartment. There's no lack of void. See, there it is. Compartmentalized, like in a box. Yep, there Here they the are. void is a box. Yep. That they're captured in. Yeah. They're partly captured in, at least. Yeah. Oh, look, other boxes. Here's another one. <clears throat> Dee Dee says, so where were we yesterday evening, according to you? How would I know? In another compartment. There's no lack of void. So I, I put this twice, I think. It meant so much to me. It's always at nightfall, says Dee Dee. Gogo says, but oh. night doesn't fall. It'll fall all of a sudden, like yesterday. Then it'll be night, and we can go again. Then it'll be day again. See, again, Beckett does it. The repetition, the, the cyclical... Cyclical repetition. Yeah, the cyclical memory. Yeah, the, yeah. We are no longer alone, says Dee Dee, waiting for the night, waiting for Rideau. Waiting for, waiting, all evening we have struggled, unassisted, now it's over. It's already tomorrow. Help! They hear Pazzo. And Dee says, time flows again already. The sun will set, the moon will rise, and we away from here. There they are. There they are at the end. Well, says Dee, shall we go? Gogo says, yeah, let's go. They don't move. It's the end. Mm -hmm. and, let, and, the, and you have that circular motion happening in the sky again, but this time you outlined it in red. Yeah. Red dots, like yeah. blood red. Yeah, and this is the back of the cover. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is good. If you look through the pictures on the table, there's a picture of Marshall in a, a uterine shape hiding in his cave hmm. that he did a painting of, and he used that several times. That's the one, yes. That's the one. Okay, I got some stuff here. Marshall in his cave, studying. 
Here's a painter of a hole. And the, the woman is floating. Gross did this one for 1948 and the other one 1950. This one is 48 and this one's 1950. And there's several more. No, the painter of the hole. Painter of the hole. The hole is the, the subject of the painting. Yes. Well, um, Gross was very depressed then. 1948, this is after World War II. Yeah, he was beginning to his downslide into death, which happened 10 years, 11 years later. And so the wreckage, look at the wreckage of all those yeah. holes. There are so many hole paintings. Yeah. One is destroyed after the other. The painter is hardly there. He's emaciated. He's He's Almost. a stick-like person. Yeah, a stick-like person. And he's, see, there. He's carrying his canvas, which is nothing but stripes. And there's a meat hook with a piece of something on it. Yeah. Now, these became very important at Gross. Hmm. Yeah. He was also doing a lot of drinking then, too. And his relationship with his wife was not good. She was very mad at him because of his drinking, which is understandable. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that those are the only two. There's a great deal of desperation in those images. Yeah. This one, Jerome, is for you. It's called The Agitator. The one in pink? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a face! <laughs> yeah. When was that done? 19. The Agitator. 1955. <clears throat> but this book didn't honor enough of these painters as a whole because I think that was a major statement that he made mm -hmm. at this time. Mm Okay, now do we have anything of Marshall's? We have this one photograph. <clears throat> All right, let's see what we have too. What else? No, what about the Philoctetes also? Are we, uh, all right, and we can stop Where's, the where's the Among Friends? Oh. Among Friends, yeah. I, am, I can really zoom into the details of this picture. And it's uh, to see, I can zoom in, you can see all of the leaves, you can see a tremendous detail. All the shadows of the trunks of the trees, and we see the gravestones. Okay, so now I'm set. You did it? Yep. I'll talk about this when I deal with the painting, okay? When you deal with the painting, okay. You can see how I changed it from the drawing. Okay. This is my friend's house, and where she grew up is her mother's house. And I carried them into the painting. Oh. Okay, now this. Okay, I, I painted this in New Hampshire, <coughs> in Warren, New Hampshire, in 1963, but I did the drawing in 1962, <coughs> and. I, I got these 
houses of my dear friend Bertha, her house and barn, her mother's house in, and I made a circle around them. And this is the cemetery where she is now buried. And I did a study of the tombstones and the gate. I made a gate post there, which is sort of not here in the drawing. And then, as you can see, I raised the mountain way up because it had the sense of down, falling down, the road falling down, and up and disappearing. And here it is here. But the mountain was too low. This is Mount Musilaki. And it had telephone wires, which would have pushed it back. So when I painted it, I took those out. <laughs> and the, the, the innovative thing for me in this was to take the tree branches and have them melt into the <coughs> folds of the mountain as it rises up. And th this was the um, <coughs> eclipse that I remember as a child there. Oh. It, the total eclipse of the sun was very exciting. So I made it all black in the middle. And the circle around their houses and this, and then the sky sweeping <coughs> around. And the tombstone standing solid. And the grass, the autumn grass coming, the colors changing. And these old cemeteries are a wonderful place. And the, the white lawn, the white of the tombstones piling out in between these gateposts. That's something, when I did that, I got really happy. And this one, the, the white is being blocked by this for some reason, but it, mm. it had nowhere to go. So I didn't put it in and moving between. That's Mount Muzalaki, which I climbed with my father and my brothers. But this is, more or less says what it says, but I swept in and pinched and let go, pinch and let go with these forms. So I extended the drawing into something more, more motion. I was parked on Route 2 facing the back of the old fire station, this building here, which has now been completely redone. And I had put masking tape here for all these trees that were in front of me. And I was going to paint, paint them in. But I thought, no, this is perfect. Ghost trees in winter and the snow and everything. Uh. So I peeled off the tape and I just put a little blue here and there. And, and that's what it looked, and this is perfect. Ghostly fingers. It's very simple. It's just the back of those buildings which now don't look like that anymore. Is that the fire station in Plainfield? It's an old one, 19th century. Yeah. And this ch church steeple is in the background. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. then this wonderful oil tank. Yeah. yeah. This was the last painting I did in uh, Newfoundland. I just had been painting every day, and there's nothing like every day, and I just sat there and I went like this, whoosh, and then whoosh, and then I made this hill and the church and this. I did it in about 10 minutes. That was because I was really geared up. And that's, under, I this is one of my favorite paintings. I'd love to go back there and spend another three months. <sighs> I love the people. Okay, I was in White River Junction and I went down this road and I found this the snow had just melted and the spring was just happening. And I found this piece of equipment that, which was uncovered by the snow melting. And I thought, there's a challenge to paint that. It was all red and rusted. And, and I, th I think I got it good. Different pinks and reds. And then that barn which had Take back Vermont, but I didn't want to write the whole thing there. It's <laughs> so awful. And the cows are going out the pasture here, and these two horses are standing by the water. Hmm. And, you know, it's a simple picture, but 
The machinery was hard to get right. Not to mention that falling down barn. That's right. All right, now we start with car retro. I did this in the late 60s. I found this wonderful place with all these cars and the forms. Since I was driving a Model A Ford, I was really into the forms of cars. The forms of these cars, which are probably from the 60s or 50s, my car looks so much better and more elegant compared to them, and this is what happens to them. And it's erupting the surficial into what is happening underneath. And it's about death and dismemberment and decay and what's left from our civilization, so-called. That's what it is. And you see that VW in the center? Yes. Oh yeah, now I do. Yeah. And I drove the VW for years. The bug. The bug, yeah. You can get killed in those. Yeah, there's nothing in the front, there's no engine. To <coughs> right. There's that groaning thing in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the fact that the whole Volkswagen idea was, you know, it was hit one of Hitler's big ideas. It was one of Hitler's big ideas. Yeah. Such beautiful detail, Randy. And these, you make such fabulously graceful lines in them. You know, it's serious that where they. Well, that's it's partial teaching about line. Mm. If you don't have a big background in drawing, it's hard to be a painter and have anything work out. I think. Mm. So you mean, would you say you have to find the details in the drawing and then you, you go through a, a kind of reduction, compression process in the painting? Well, to you, express? You organize it in a more artistic way. These drawings, are mainly that's the way they look. about this place was the way the plants came in and covered the cars. Goldenrod and Queen Anne's lace and vines of all kinds and everything. The way the cars tipped this way and that way. Is that See, the, these are 1930 cars, mm -hmm. late 30s, or early 40s. This one had a tire mounted on the back. Yeah. And Where was this? No, this was in Danbury, Connecticut. The architecture of those cars. Yeah, and they speak a lot about what's happening with America in a throwaway world. You ready? June 1961. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And look at the beautiful study of the grasses. Reminds me of George Gross's study of the uh, of the grasses in uh, Cape Cod. Cape Cod. But you didn't know him then, exactly. Had you know? Did you? I know met him then. Yeah. You met him then. But I didn't know about his work very much. 1960. Do you think that uh, was in that Connecticut? Uh, would it yeah. have been? Yeah, 
was in Connecticut somewhere. I don't know where. My father had a truck just like that. A Model B Ford truck. Oh. That he burned up. Don't get me started about him. Well, this one is very simple. Turnover with the frame uh, hanging up in the air. And then another vehicle that's right side up in the background. This is almost like a haiku, sim simplified down to the simplest of the forms. All right, this drawing, you ready for me? Yes. Has a lot of the motion and the twist of the wreckage. And the grass is shooting up and the car is shooting down and, and here's a whole muffler here. And it's, it's in motion. Hmm. Seems that way to me. And I think I saw that when I did the drawing. See, I don't know where the other part of the car is. It's, it's understated. Unstated. Hmm. It's in the act of disappearance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, after all these years, these, these drawings are familiar to me. Well, then I discovered that these empty trucks, these vans, made a nice backdrop for the parts that were suffering and groaning from being dismembered. And, you know, the way they get stacked is so interesting. Mm -hmm. But that one is an empty truck in the back, so it highlighted that hood. And the hood ornament. A beautiful old farmhouse. With a I model. have no idea where this was done. But this truck looks frightened, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a the hood ornament. And the aerial. Huh. And the old uh, cupola on top of the barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. should be called the barn is still standing. Despite everything. The cars are gaping. Cars are gaping. Gaping? Yeah. What do you mean gaping? <laughs> <laughs> they are gasping. You mean gasping? Gasping for breath. For breath. Their last energy. On that truck the doors are open. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Painted <laughs> this in Warren, New Hampshire, when they were working on the roads. Uh -huh. And it took me hours. It was the same year I did that drawing of the cemetery. Uh -huh. And look what a wonderful thing happened here. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> you mean time itself added to your original conception of... Someone threw up on it. Oh, great. <laughs> but boy, I'll tell you, this is hard to do with a reed pen. I bet. It's very hard. Yeah. You have to really concentrate. A reed pen. Yeah. Uh, this is a pen you made yourself? Yes. These are all reed pen drawings. So how did you make this pen? Out of what? You cut it, cut the reed, and you shape the point. You mean a reed that you found in the river? In the swamps. In the swamp. Yeah. So that's it. And there, there's no wreck here. This is a bulldozer at rest. And I love the shadow here and then the porch. Yeah, a lot of depth. There's, there's a lot of depth in this drawing. Yeah, it was July. It was a very hot day, I remember. Your sense of perspective is really sharp here. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's 
life. It sits right in front of you. There it is. Things that are further away are smaller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you have saying it's great big right in front of you all the time. <laughs> Clamoring for your attention. Are you done? Yes. Okay. Do that. And the bottom is tickling. Like this should be out. I don't mind the drips, but this. Oh, I didn't see what you were pointing to. That line, you mean? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't think it really bothers. I think it gives an, uh, some kind of indication of an even further foreground that you could have had. Well, there it is. There's a Model A, and there's the rest of it. Calm mm -hmm. and stress. Mm -hmm. Sure, I can't cut... I want to hit the chopper and chop this down. I, I can't stand this. This is not. So hang up another one. This, this, this. Oh, that's beautiful. See, I like these little vistas it makes through the darkness into the light. Mm. <laughs> mm. The way the forms express themselves in the negative. Yeah. Uh, space. Yes. It's like a brilliant, this is a brilliant uh, exploration of the negative space. But because the negative space becomes the trees, even, right? Uh, the, they're like, they start emitting so much life among, this, among these, that's among true. the death. Jerome, you gotta write this up, because that's a good thing to say. so exploratory they just make you want to go into them and into them you know what is going on yeah. thank you Jerome I've never heard good things about this artwork of mine ever I just kept on doing them it's very interesting you made instead of making junk sculpture like you might have by going into the junkyard and pulling out certain pieces from here or there, you decided that the whole place itself was sculpture. It is. <coughs> and life against death mm. over and over again. Mm. So they're very meditative, really. They're deeply contemplative. of a subject that nobody <laughs> nobody would ever dream of. This should be a subject for contemplation, right? People would not think that wrecks would be a subject for contemplation. Wrecks? Yeah, these are car wrecks. These are to oh, be wrecks. discarded, not to be thought of anymore. And you have chosen them as a subject of contemplation. Right. And you attempt to bring people into that. You raise, you're raising the question, you know, you're raising questions rather than <clears throat> making answers. You're asking people to deal with this, to work, to, you know, to Just work with this. Just asking them to look, I guess. <clears throat> to look, yeah, to see, <laughs> to see. To see. Yeah. Okay. That one. So you can tell this was a plumber. The boat, you know. Yeah. I remember those. Oh, that big dark place up there at the top. Yeah. Underbelly, the guts, the darkness when the guts have been removed. This one you can still see the dashboard. 
in the seat and everything. Hmm. Even though someone ripped into the top. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can see everything. Was, that was a luxury car. But that, that a monumental piece of something that looks like a whale emerging from the <laughs> sea. Like. Yeah. Coming up for air. This was made where? In Connecticut somewhere, Danbury probably. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first ones that has the road in it, and not just the thrown in a field. Oh. But they're climbing up by the trees. The trees have climbed through them or something. Oh. And there's a car waiting in, in, in regular life. <laughs> and this is the graveyard life. The afterlife. Yeah, and it's swarming to get out. Yeah, it's swarming to get out. And the trees are growing through the wrecks. Is what yeah. you Yeah. <laughs> and they're such beautiful trees, too. What powerful yeah. trees they are. <gasps> they are. Yeah. Very powerful. And those lines, you have the lines of the uh, telephone poles. Yeah. In there too, in contrast to the trees. Yeah. Are like tree wrecks. Yeah. They're held together by wires. <laughs> They're holding. Be, used to be living trees. No. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, you've, you're signing this drawing some 54 years, possibly, after you made it? Do you, yeah. what, when, how would you date it? In the 60s. Early? Yeah. Part of this period? Yeah. Here you, you seem to be studying the line, a kind of a, abstraction of the subject itself while still retaining, while allowing it to retain its elemental form? Something like that, girl. I think that sounds good. <laughs> this one is th so detailed. This is very hard to do. The halo. This, this is the hay loader. It loads up loose hay into the truck. I think Rembrandt would uh, have been proud of you for doing this drawing. Well, thank you, Joan. That's a big compliment. Look at the, I mean, the study of the shadows and the light and their interplay. And this is the track that pulls these around all the way up to here and back down around. Good. Perfect. Yep. I did this in the 1970s. In a railroad yard? Is this in a railroad? Yeah. I think I was in West Virginia when I did that one. Huh. It was on my, my other runaway. Did you write, were you, you were not writing the rails then. I, I did. I wrote them on the way back. You did? Yeah, 1973, I think. You hitched. You hitched on the rails. D I always wanted to do that. And you got, you went from where to where? West Virginia? Somewhere in Ohio to um, near Albany, New York. <coughs> no, not Albany, uh, Buffalo. <coughs> okay, good. Okay. Yeah, I did this when I was in. Ohio, West Virginia, one of those states, and hopping freights. That's why the paper is smaller. What a study in perspective. 
it has that it has that sense of when the when the cars when they go over a bump they do shift they shift their weight over to the left or the right they and when you're inside them you you rise up about three inches then you hit metal again on the way down you feel like you're covered with bruises when you're finished <laughs> when you climb out did you ever meet any other women when you were riding the rails? No. I was with Billy Lee. I didn't want to meet any other people in that condition. Hmm. It was scary. Were you with Billy Lee when you made this? Yeah, because he showed me how to do it. He showed you how to do it? What do you mean? How to hop freights. Oh. This is understated. Yeah. How do you mean? Well, it kind of works as a drawing. The white space in the middle. And I don't know, it, it works to me. That <coughs> That white space in the middle is really interesting because... I like it too, because there's this one, then there's this one, and then there's these. And underneath. And there's that beautiful car. Yeah. Which was your car? Yeah, I got it when I was down. I went, I ran away to Washington and got a job as a waitress. And I made enough money to buy that car for... 300 bucks and, and new tires. I saved it all up and I bought that car. I drove home mm. in it from Washington to, to Connecticut. And then rode, drove it back to New York where I lived in this place on Canal Street. So that car is parked on Canal Street eventually? Yeah, and somebody slashed the tires there. So, mm. oh. so I had to yeah, different things happened that were not nice. Hmm. But here, it was kind of in an idyllic setting. <laughs> as a subject, <laughs> with the white right. space being there. Well, it was a black car, and so... Oh. It was interesting with all these plants and weeds and things. Okay, we have a car. It's your car. It's your Model A in a graveyard. No? Yeah. I drove it in there. I did a drawing of it and then drove it out. <laughs> the Model A became your artist's model. Yeah. So you brought it around to different places and... But in this series, it's part of this car series, the, the profound sense of the passing of time. Uh, yeah. That's really what the cemeteries and everything are all about. You did a huge study of Proust before these, right? Yeah. Would you say that you were carrying on the Proustian vision? Well, Proust had a big effect on me. You done? No, I want to know about the big effect of Proust on you. I'm not done. I'm <laughs> yeah, well, that's what Proust is all about. Time, what happened to people over time, what happened to him over time. And when you finally get through all 2,000 pages, it took me two years, uh, it's, it's in you. Uh -oh. Did you take a picture of it? Yes. I've always been fascinated with cemeteries and death and all that kind of thing. I've always had been. And all what kind of thing? You mean death? Ceremonies change, of death. You know, mm. which is not hidden from us anymore. Please all right. This yeah. is the last image of this series I did.
don't look back. It had to do with my divorce and my fascination with what lies underneath the surficial line. The surficial line? Yeah. What is the surficial line? Here's one right here. And here's one right here. And there's this moon and here's an echo of that. This mm. is a piece of metal I found in the street of Detroit. And this is a piece of metal I cut and inked. And this plate has impasto on it that dried. And a piece of paper cut out figure of ghost. And I inked it. And you see how nice it makes it, the, the textures came mm. out really well. And I put these all together like this. And it's really like the end, and the series is about, you know, the horse looking down and diving into the underworld and all those things. And this has got a lot of stillness in it. This is the end. What's underneath reflects like what's on top. And that's mm. as far as I went with that. I didn't mm -hmm. need to go any further. You have to know when to stop and when to keep going. Mm -hmm. Oh, I this is the end of a series of how many works, would you say? Seven, I think. Don't Look Back series. Yeah. I printed five of these. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that easy mm -hmm. to print. So the surficial world, this was your exploration of the surficial world, the what's surficial under line. The surface, what's under. Under. And then. It's all about under and over. And then you, in this one, you have under and under, even, and right? Also you have two under surficial. And reflection of what's over. You could turn this mm. upside down and hang it that way, too. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't mm -hmm. work quite as well. Mm -hmm. Because you want that darkness on the bottom, which brings it down. Yeah, well, it, it's the big darkness that we all sink into. Silent snow, secret snow. It's in bed and it's beginning to snow. And it goes on. It's beautiful writing and it fills up his whole room. Comes it's in the house and holds And he doesn't know whether he's dreaming or it's real. Or it's, I read that in high school. I still remember it.